Hello and welcome to the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is March 17th, 2022. Here is the Feisty News for Women. But first, the Feisty News needs your support. The Feisty News for Women is an independent feminist news show self-funded by me, T. Erica. As a women's advocate for over the past 10 years, I've created so many support programs for women. Why? Because I needed support. Every time I need support and then I figured it out by myself, I decided to create the same support for women. I've proven myself to be a woman of high character and I work hard and produce results and support for women consistently. This week, I started a Kickstarter for the Feisty News. I'm trying to raise $10,000 so that I can keep this news show going while I continue to produce episodes and celebrate women. If you appreciate the work I do, please stand with me by offering your financial support. On Kickstarter, the funding is all or nothing. So if I don't meet my $10,000 goal, your pledge won't be charged at all. The Feisty News is an important resource for women. This show educates, empowers, and celebrates women who are making a difference in our society. This is the brilliant woman's chance to shine. Please stand with me and actively show your support as I continue my lifelong work for the advancement of women. Visit thefeistynews.com to find the link to the Kickstarter. Only 12 days left to fund or fail. Or there are other ways to show support. Thank you. In World Affairs. It is day 21 of the Russian war against Ukraine. On February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in order to overtake the capital city and claim it as its own territory. Since then, a theater in the city of Maripol, where hundreds of people are said to have taken shelter, sustained heavy damage in a bombing Wednesday. President Vladimir Zelensky called for a humanit humanitarian no-fly zone over Ukraine in a virtual address to U.S. Congress and Slovakia has pre preliminarily agreed to provide Ukraine with a key Soviet area air defense system to help defend against Russian airstrikes. In the midst of these updates, we have Allison Gill, the host of the Daily Beans podcast. Allison serves up social justice and political news, speaking what she believes is the truth, no matter the consequences. Allison, welcome back to the Feisty. Can you give us an update on the traumatic events that are now unfolding? and how they impact the trajectory of this war. Hey, T. Erica. First of all, thanks for having me back on the Feisty. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, today, uh, President Zelensky, Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine, addressed a joint session of Congress in the United States and gave a very impassioned speech. He invoked 9-11, he invoked Pearl Harbor, and then asked once again if we would help close the sky in Ukraine, which means a no-fly zone. And shortly after that, President Biden came on and said, we are giving another 800 million. President Biden just signed a bill, our new budget, which gives 13.6 billion in aid, in addition to the 800 million he's sending now. And we, I think the mistake that we made last time, particularly with the MiG-29s from Poland, was that everybody knew about it. And, you know, if you tell everybody what you're going to do, then that gives the Russians the opportunity to sabotage it. So I think Biden kept his cards very close to his chest today. We don't know exactly what equipment, if it's going to include S-400s, which are long range um, missiles that can take missiles out of the sky and, and Russian fighter jets out of the sky to help protect the sky over Ukraine. But short of putting boots on the ground, American troops on the ground in Ukraine, that would be needed to completely block the sky. So we didn't imagine that Ukraine would last 24 hours. And I think what happened is, is including Vladimir Putin himself, overestimated his abilities in Ukraine. And the Ukrainians are some just absolutely the most brave and resilient people, particularly the women and children who are either staying behind or fleeing. We know that there's been about two to three million refugees fleeing. And women in other countries, including Germany and Poland, are doing everything that they can to help 
get these Ukrainian families and women and children to safety as Russia continues to bombard cities and civilians and maternity hospitals and bomb shelters from the air. So it's a very tenuous and, and disturbing and awful and horrible situation on the ground in Ukraine. And I really hope that the United States, even though keeping their cards to their chest a little bit, uh, are, are really doing absolutely everything that they can that doesn't cross any red lines that would lead us into a major war. Thank you, Allison. You mentioned that the U.S. has agreed to support Ukraine by sending more than $800 million in military aid. But that's extremely supportive and may trigger Putin to believe he has to be on the defense. Do you know what Putin might be thinking? What, what is too much for us to do without pushing him to start a world war? Yeah, T. Erica, it's kind of hard to define that line. Our intelligence community knows, um, and they know what Putin would consider a step too far. Though I frankly don't understand why we assume that Vladimir Putin would play by any rules. Um, he is an unhinged, at the end of his life, dictator. Uh, and I don't know. It's hard for us to gauge what he would do. But I think the intelligence community, the U.S. intelligence community, has their finger on the pulse of what would be crossing the line. And they're very like little tiny things, too. Like we can send possibly send MiG-29s, which are fighter jets that the Ukrainians know how to fly over to that country. But flying them in from a NATO base may be considered uh, an act of aggression. And so it's really up to our administration NATO and our intelligence communities to decide what, according to Putin, would be considered an offensive action versus a defensive action. And I, you know, worked, and I know you worked, and we all worked very hard to elect this administration and this Senate. Uh, and I believe, and who then appointed everyone in the intelligence community. And I, I have to trust their decision. But I also listen to folks like. Uh, Alexander Vindman and Mike McFall, former ambassador to Russia, and Masha Yovanovitch, former ambassador to Ukraine, and their calls for doing more than we are doing. And I hope that we do. Uh, I just want people to understand that we can't announce what we're going to be doing because that gives the Russians an advantage to sabotage it. I see. Okay. Thank you, Allison. Follow Allison in the Daily Beans podcast on your favorite podcast platform for more political and daily news. In other news, in 2008, Melissa Lucio was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death by a Texas judge for the death of her two-year-old daughter, Mariah. Mariah had gone down for a nap and never woke up. Just two hours after Melissa discovered that her baby was deceased, she was taken into police custody and interrogated for five hours. At the end of the lengthy interrogation where police demanded that she admit to killing her daughter, Melissa said, I guess I did it. Investigators later learned that Mariah's death occurred two days after she had accidentally fallen down a flight of stairs and sustained a head injury, which may have led to the death that Melissa falsely confessed to. She has since declared her innocence for her claims have been ignored. During Melissa's trial, the prosecution did not present physical evidence or witness testimony establishing that Melissa abused Mariah or any of her other 12 children. She was not even allowed to defend herself during her trial when she was convicted and sentenced to death by a Texas judge. Melissa has spent 14 years on death row in Texas and has recently been given an execution date, April 27. Adrian Larimer is an attorney and clinical teaching fellow in the Cornell Center on the Death Penalty Worldwide. Adrian has been practicing in criminal defense law for 15 years with the focus in capital cases for the last eight years. Welcome to the feisty, Adrian. Let's talk about Melissa's case. First, please let us know how Melissa is doing and then help us to understand how the accidental death of her daughter led to a death sentence for mom. Hi, Tierica. Thank you so much for having me on the Feisty. I am so grateful to be here to share about Melissa Lucio's uh, case and her story. Um, Melissa's doing about as well as can be expected under the circumstances. She's 
communicating with her lawyer several times a week, getting visits and support from her family. Um, she's also deeply religious and um, practices the Catholic faith. So she's getting support from the Catholic community and her religious leaders. Um, and part of that is that Melissa does have a lot of hope um, and hope that the powers that be will do the right thing here um, and withdraw her execution date so she can pursue a new trial or that the governor will grant her clemency um, so she can attempt to secure her freedom. Um, part of our work um, at the Cornell Center on the Death Penalty Worldwide, which is um, part of, of Melissa's team representing her, um, we have something that we call the ALICE Project. Uh, it's the first global project to focus on women facing capital punishment and examining their role and the role of gender in death penalty cases. Um, in Melissa's case, she was immediately zeroed in on as the perpetrator because it was perceived that she wasn't behaving as expected in the eyes of the police um, who were mostly male um, and the first responders. Um, she wasn't crying, uh, she wasn't hysterical, she wasn't behaving in a way that they assumed um, a woman should behave under these circumstances. Um, and so, you know, part of that then translates onto the trial. Um, you know, initially, this is a case where Mariah fell down the stairs a few days prior. Um, you know, Melissa didn't witness the fall, some of her children did, uh, but Mariah was behaving okay after that. Melissa, of course, regrets not getting medical care sooner for her, um, but isn't guilty of murder. And um, her partner, Robert, who was the male involved in this situation, was only found guilty of child endangerment and sentenced to four years, um, even though he did have a history of assaultive behavior with um, Child Protective Services records. Um, and so, you know, part of the basis for sentencing in this case, the prosecution asked the jury to consider that she wasn't seen crying or screaming, um, that she was cold hearted. Um, and they asked them to take into consideration a lot of things that they wouldn't have if she had been, you know, if, if she had been a male. And that when you look in comparison at the transcript in Robert's case, that they didn't call into question that they didn't have those expectations of him. Interesting. I see. Well, literally, because she is a woman, she was expected to be crying and hysterical. And since she wasn't, that was taken as a sign that she was guilty. Have there been similar cases in the past? And how many of them have led to the accused woman being exonerated? So, you know, it's actually upsetting how many similar cases there have been um, to Melissa's. And especially when you look at how many cases where women have been exonerated in alarmingly circum similar circumstances. Um, you know, especially in this case, this was a case of an accidental death, a fall down the stairs, um, and the police were taking Melissa's body language, slumped shoulders, expressionless face, things like that into account, and actually gave the jury testimony that this meant that she had, that she looked guilty they could tell that she was guilty just by looking at her. Um, and in fact, Melissa um, is the victim of a, a lifetime of gender-based violence. And the experts say that the type of behavior she was exhibiting is exactly what you would expect of somebody who um, has post-traumatic stress syndrome and is somebody who has um, endured a lifetime of, of physical sexual abuse. Um, and there are so many similar stories of women who have been found guilty and put on death row or been given life sentences um, where no crime existed at all, or later the forensic evidence revealed that the cause of death was something completely different. Um, you'll see a lot of cases in the past where a shaken baby syndrome was something that the experts were testifying about at the time that, you know, these women were guilty of shaking their babies to death, and these just aren't things that have proven over time to be reliable and true. And so we are, of course, extremely hopeful that Melissa will um, get the support from the community and that the prosecution will withdraw that execution date so that she does get an opportunity to present an actual defense in this case. There's been um, a decision from the Fifth Circuit Court where they found that she did not get to present a full defense. And unfortunately, 
that decision was overturned by the full panel based on technicalities, not based on the merits of the case. So, you know, given that there's been exonerations in the past for very similar circumstances, we feel that Melissa has an extremely strong case that really needs to be looked at in full, and we're very hopeful that she'll get relief. Thank you, Adrian. We want to support. What can we do to stop Melissa's execution? Thank you so much for asking that. Melissa needs all the support that she can get. Um, we have a petition that is available um, through the Innocence Project's website. Um, people can go to our website at the Cornell Center on the death penalty worldwide. And there are links to social media posts, um, things that you can share, tweets that you can share. We have something going on right now, 50 days of action of things that you can do to promote awareness about Melissa's case, reach out to the prosecutor in Cameron County. Um, and all of those things are available through the Innocence Project or through the information about Melissa on the Cornell Center at the Death Penalty Worldwide's website. And we really would appreciate as much support for Melissa as we can get. She truly is an innocent woman on death row and desperately needs um, the community's support. We got it, Adrian. Ladies and gentlemen, let's show off our superpowers by doing everything we can to stop the execution of Melissa Lucio. Please first text save Melissa to 97016 for updates about the execution and then sign the petition to stop the execution on innocenceproject.org. Last, ask Cameron County District Attorney Lewis Sayings to withdraw Melissa's April 27th execution date. Call 956-300-3831. Thanks, Adrian. In other news, European Union states have taken another look at establishing firm rules for gender equality in the workplace. Under these new rules, firms would be required to appoint women to at least 40% of non-executive director roles or 33% of all board jobs by 2027. This law has been in draft mode for 10 years while under debate and revision. The proposed legislation would apply to companies that have at least 250 employees, with estimates suggesting it could affect some 2,300 firms. The 27 member states employment and social affairs ministers have agreed in principle on the proposal, but no one knows if it will ever be approved and turned into law. The renewed interest in the business quota comes after studies showed the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affected women from jobs to domestic violence, deepen deepening gender inequality in the bloc. Well, what does this mean for women? If large scale businesses were required to have 40% of non-executive director roles filled by women, I stutter at the scope of how this would change workplace environments on a social level and on the level of how efficiently the business is ran. For centuries, women have been managing households efficiently while only earning the right to live in the house. Imagine how that same efficiency would add to a workplace environment. Then again, imagine the drawbacks. How would men react to their business boys club being interrupted? We may have the answers to my questions very soon since the EU's women on boards requirement may not be necessary. In fact, reports show that women continue to outnumber men in college completion rates and according to the Business Wire, the number of women-owned businesses increased by 3,000% since 1972. Whether or not the world is ready for a female-led society, it's happening. Time for a break. Guess what happened the very moment a woman declared that she'd given up on love? <laughs> well, did you know that patriarchy was defeated in January? You didn't? Well, guess who defeated patriarchy? I did. You got to watch the battle against patriarchy. It's all coming up next. Don't miss it. All my life I had to fight. I had to fight my daddy. I had to fight my uncles. I had to fight my brothers. Girl child ain't safe in the family mansion. But I ain't never thought I had to fight in my own house. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in history, we are about to witness the transition of our society. 
Tonight, we will watch the oppressor versus the savior in a fight for women's rights. Coming to the ring, the mercenary of mayhem, the deliverer of destruction, the one who comes to rob, kill, and destroy the progress of women, Master. to the ring, the deliverer of justice, the torch bearer for equality, the woman who wants to see every woman prosper, Shia, the female warrior! We're ready for this bout. Master Patriarchy versus Shia, the female warrior. As we can see by this toe to toe, Master Patriarchy. He definitely has a height and reach advantage. But Shia comes out swinging. Body shots, head shots. Shia is showing everybody what women's rights are all about. The patriarchy almost putting his hands up like he had enough. She was right and left and right and left. Master patriarchy. Without that mask on, I mean, he's about, I would guess, six four. White male. Being the uh, African American princess, the African American Ethiopian. That is the end of the first round. If you look at both of these fighters, they kind of gave it all in the first round. Let's we'll see how it comes on the second round. I would definitely get that first round to Shia. Master Patriot, we are in the second round now. Shia again coming out swinging hard. I think Master Patriarch, he might be rope a a little bit. He's, those blows look a little low. Oh, 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 she is taking some shots. He's fighting back, though. I don't know about those, those blows are too low by Master Patriarch. Oh, one to the head, one to the body. He's trying to fight back. Patriot gets one big shot to the head. Shia is wobbly. I think the referee needs to step in on those low blows, perhaps. Shia goes down. A little bit taunting there by Master Patriarchy. Not showing good sportsmanship here in this boxing match. That is the end of round two. That run, I definitely would have to give to Master Patriarchy. If they had corners, I think Shia's corners got to be telling her to get back in there. Oh, she's already taking a beating early. I don't know if I like this by, by Master Patriarchy. He's just peppering her shots all over. I think some of those were low blows still. She is down once again. But right back up. She has given it all she's got. Whoa! Master Patriarchy, and he is dancing around like he owns the place. She is up once again. She is getting battered once again by the Patriarchy. Down once again to Shia. I don't know if she's got enough to win this. But the Master Patriarch with his hands up like he has won this fight. She has no quit in her. She's throwing everything she's got. 
Patriarchy, we are going. No, no, Master Patriarchy has won this bout. I question the uh, the ethics by Master Patriarchy. Those were some low blows, if you ask me. But he doesn't seem to care. Showing off to the fans, showing off to the crowd. She is still down on the count. Oh, she is. Is making her way up. Mass Patriot is dancing around. Thinking he's the greatest thing ever. She had turned around. One big blow and Master Patriarchy is down. That is a win for women's rights everywhere. She uh, the female warrior. She may have not won the fight, but she won the war. Welcome back. I am T. Erica with the feisty news for women. Girl, guess what? Did you see me whoop Master Patriarchy's butt? Yes, I did. I was tired after this, and so was he. <laughs> but now that patriarchy has been defeated, we are all free to redefine our roles in society and heal ourselves from hundreds of years of psychological damage. In other news, good news. We found another good man. The Feisty shares so many stories of men who are less than supportive to women that I sought to find out if good men even existed. It turns out that they do. And I made it my mission to share this great news by asking women to tell us about the good men in their lives. If you would have asked Jamie if she knew a good man a year ago, she probably would have said, mm -mm, no. But today she has a different story and I'm glad to hear it. Let's ask her, hey Jamie, do you know a good man? Girl, yes, I know a good man and his name is Robert. We met a few months ago. At first I thought he was weird, sis, cause I was outside uh, eating lunch with a friend and we're ironically enough conversing about, you know, how we're um, just have this expectation of love and it just wasn't happening. And I saw this guy roll through the parking lot and we locked eyes, but I didn't think anything of it. Um, and so I continue to talk, you know, to my friend and the guy probably like 30 minutes later, uh, rode back by. Now, mind you, he said, cause we ultimately, you know, began talking. He said that I threw my hands up at him. So can I tell you, sis, this man made a U-turn in the parking lot came back pulled alongside the building that we were eating like the the back of the building that we were eating in like this outside part walked up and said to me uh hi my name is robert i had to introduce myself to this beautiful lady with this beautiful smile and it literally has uh our relationship has bloomed from there and why I am so incredibly in awe and appreciative of our relationship and his confidence in the way that he loves me uh, is because I'm a domestic violence survivor. And so for me to meet a man like Robert, I honestly had given up on the possibility that, you know, men like him existed. And so um, it's just been an incredible ride. I am in therapy as a result of my domestic violence situation and i'm continuing to be in therapy and i thank my creator for my therapist because the man that robert is he's so incredibly different than what i've experienced that uh, what i've noticed my therapist and i have noticed is that i've uh, had a few instances of subconsciously um sabotaging our relationship with questioning his motives and questioning, you know, if I should trust him. Now, mind you, he's not giving me really a reason not to not trust him other than me standing in my authentic truth and, and realizing and accepting that I, I was bringing my baggage into our relationship. And what a good man looks like, you know, for me, 
and for the relationship that I'm in with him is he's very supportive. I'm extremely busy. Um, he's extremely patient in that, like, we'll have, you know, dinner, a dinner date at six o'clock and I'll text him at 6.05. I'll be there in 10 minutes and end up being there at 6.30. And he's, he still greets me with the consistent same love as he would had I been there um, on time or been there to meet him. Um, I just, I... I'm, I'm in awe. I'm definitely in awe. I it was sharing with my sister not too long ago that, you know, it is just blows my mind how the universe works and how my creator works because I literally was literally talking about just, you know, giving up on love the very, very day that, that he met me. So the power of manifestation is real. Um, I believe in my whole heart that because I've been on this healing journey to show up to this one life that I have to live the best version of myself that I can be, despite all the disappointments that I've gone through, that the light that I've been working on to shine attracted Robert's light. And we just have this beautiful thing called love um, manifesting. Keep going. Get it. Get it. You better get it. Hit him with the shoulders. Hit them with the shoulders. You, you better hit them with the shoulders, baby. Thank you so much, Robert C. Brown Jr. for being such a good man to Jamie. Wounded women need a special type of man to be a healing force. Thank you for seeing her value and for being the type of man a woman like Jamie can brag about. We all appreciate you. Thank you for watching the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. Remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. News for women.